second. So do we have a first? We had a first. first? I'll make a motion to accept the agenda. Chris is a second. I accept it. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Say, say Aye. 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 Okay. Yep. Okay. Passed. Moving on to our uh, second, uh, third item, uh, open meeting law. I just want to have a, a brief discussion. There's no real action need to come on this. Just wanted to talk and make sure everyone understood. Um, for some people that are well versed, uh, like Marianne and other people that are involved in municipal government, um, understand open meeting law. But for those that aren't, you know, we've got to be uh, aware that their laws protecting uh, protecting the information. Uh, Correct information, the free flow of information and transparency. As such, uh, we are a municipality. Yeah, you know, any of our emails, uh, you know, the email address that you use is associated with uh, the contact. You're sending emails about the uh, CUD on that. Those are open for uh, a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. We have to provide that. So be so. Just be aware of that when you are communicating, especially about the CUD and using. An email address that's specific to the uh, CUD. Understand that it is open for open for uh, requests from folks. Does everybody understand that? Have any questions yep. about it? Open the email. Okay, and I only bring this up because it has other CUDs have have had the the um, had folks request information uh, around this. We're also recording this meeting, so this is going to be posted up. On our website right now, it's be our web. All our information is being hosted at the Town of Brandon website, but uh, hopefully soon we'll have our own website where this information will all be held. Our meeting minutes, agendas, and our public uh, information. Um, so uh, moving on to agenda item number four: new member approval. So over the last few weeks, we've had a few few towns vote to join us. Uh, and as you see on the agenda, the town of Benson, the town of Chittenden, the town of West Rutland, and then Rutland Town have all voted to join and appoint members. So we could entertain a motion to approve them all as, as one group. I move to approve all of the towns that have joined up in the last week. Can you list them again? Sorry. Sure, certainly, we have the town of Benson, the town of Chittenden, the town of West Rutland, and Rutland Town. Thank you. I second the motion. I apologize for interrupting. All right. Zoom is very sort of yeah. Have to who, read people and the delay. Yeah. Who made the motion? Amanda, I think. Amanda, Amanda did. Okay. Amanda kind of made the motion. Sandra Thank seconded. You. Any discussions? Uh, Mr. Williams. I'm from I'm from Poultney, and uh, we're thinking about joining. So I'm here kind of being a fly on the wall so I can get educated about what, what it's all about. Excellent. Excellent. I'll bring this back to the select board uh, at our next meeting Monday. Perfect. That sounds great. And I mean, you know, as you know, sort of morph into new member recruitment, you know, if, if you, you know, would like, you know, anybody from the CUD to join you at the meeting to talk more about it, we, you know, we're more than happy to send a rep to talk about okay. what's involved. Thank you. Um, so at this time, uh, all those in favor of the approval of the motion to admit Benson, Chittenden, West Rutland, Rutland Town into the CUD, say aye. 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 opposed, looks like the ayes have it. Welcome, Benson, Chittenden, West Rutland, and Rutland Town, and their reps. So it sounded like it was all one big motion to accept their reps as a um, Right now, uh, West Rutland's rep, uh, main rep is Marianne Goulet, who's on our Call right now, the alternate. There's John alternate. Harvey. John Harvey. Uh, Benson is uh, their main is uh, John Hill. Uh, their uh, Gina Cole is their alternate. Uh, Rutland Town just has appointed one person. That's Bill Sweet. Um, and Chittenden, we have Andrew Quint as their main and Barbara Gabrielson as the alternate. So welcome. Oh, Bill, can you sense. email those to me so I can include them in our meeting minutes? Absolutely, absolutely. And Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll also update the uh, website after uh, probably tomorrow with the new contact information. Um, and, you know, um, fantastic. Welcome, everybody. 
Um, okay. Wife call me. I got a text her and let her know that I'm in the in a meeting. So the uh, next thing we have is RTO wireless presentation, and I am going to. I uh, just got a text from the gentleman from RTO. Um, he's asked if he should join. Uh, they're they're an organization that has a proposal to provide wireless services, and I'm. I guess it'd just be explained by him. So I'm going to uh, put us on hold just a second and uh, text him to make sure he knows to join. Um, he's got, um, he's got an interesting proposition. I think it's certainly worthy for us as a CUD to hear what they what they have to say. Is, you know. um, Bill, your microphone is pretty quiet. Just FYI. Ah, okay. I can speak up. I'm usually I'm usually the loud one, so I have no problem with speaking up. Is that better? It can also be my computer, so some people can say, "Amanda, stop," because he's loud enough. <laughs> oh no, I agree. It's kind of quiet. Okay. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. No worries. Uh, what we'll do is I'm gonna fairly confident. I gotta just email him the link. What we'll do is we'll move on to. I'm gonna skip over that agenda item if that's okay with everyone right now until he gets on and move on to uh, item six. And it's going to kind of open touch base on this while you do your communication with RTO. That would be amazing. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, of course. Um, so this is Amanda O'Connor from the RPC. Um, we um, made available RFPs for both um, website development as well as legal services. And the round for that closed yesterday. We need to have feedback out to those that submitted um, by the 28th. This has been a simple uh, uh, procurement process um, and it's going to be funded through funds from the CARES Act. So the rush is that we have to have these funds spent out. Um, the state bounces back between December 15th and December 30th. So let's go with December 15th. Um, and I would like one or two other individuals uh, from the CUD to uh, do a quick look over these with me. So that way I am not the sole person making decisions. Um, if people are completely um, uh, full in terms of their, their plate, I uh, can also put together a summary and email that out to the group as to what I think. Um, but it would be one provider for website and logo development and one provider for legal services that would help finalize all the processes to uh, form the organization, um, get our EIN, et cetera, and would then allow us to be able to consider hiring someone because right now the RRPC is acting as fiscal sponsor so the CUD can continue to operate until it has that legal support to finish establishment. Amanda, I'd be happy to help you. It's Marianne. Awesome. Thank you, Marianne. Is there a copy of the RFP somewhere? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, I have it on the website, but I will send it to you via email. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. You could also send uh, the, the website one to me as well. I might be able to help there. Okay. Yeah, we have two submittals for um, uh, the website support um, and two submittals for legal services. And you're looking for feedback on to which one you would favor, correct? Um, yeah, so we're just going to see what, what the pricing stands at, what they'd offer, um, and hopefully they've included something of quality of work. Um, I will uh, put out there that the RPC has worked with one of the submitter, sub, uh, companies that submitted an application for each, um, both uh, website development or logo development for the WIB. Um, we worked with Nate Feinberg and Group 6 on that. And um, the office that provides the RPC legal support um, also submitted um, the RFP as well. So that's another reason I want another pair of eyes is that I am um, totally biased. But I will email. Chris and Marianne. <laughs> yeah, and, and on my email address, I noticed on the screen there it was listed incorrectly. Um, it's got the town clerk 
uh, the, you know, and my email address is tkcuster at gmail.com. So the, the town clerk is, is Don, you know, my wife, that's how I got roped into this. So that's the connection <laughs> there. I, I think, I, and I, I, I'm hoping that I made the, the, the correction and still get my last email I sent out with the uh, agenda. The correction was, I think, made to your email address, keeping the, uh, let's see here. You are uh, TK Custer? Yeah, Tango Kilo Custer at gmail.com. So, yeah. so the latest email that was sent around with the OCCUD contacts that had the attached agenda has the updated information for you, and it should reflect on the website. I'll triple check to make sure now. That initial email mistake is mine with Don's. So, um, Thank you, Chris. I'll use that email. Uh, Marianne, did you have a comment real quick? Uh, I just want to know when we want to make a decision and um, do we need the full board to uh, approve it and what, what in the timing? Everybody? My process, uh, I was going to suggest that we um, take a look and send our recommendation to the um, board by email and ask for an email vote um, to approve that so we had a record of it. Um, we need to notify them no later than October 28th. So um, I will get that email sent out um, first thing tomorrow morning. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, so that would that would take care of the legal services and the website development as well. Um, RFP work. So item six and eight. So we can move back up to item five, our RTO wireless presentation information with RTO Wireless, and we have Steve Hubbard uh, from RTO Wireless. Uh, hi, Steve. Hello. Hi, Bill. This, this is the CUD board and, uh, and, and members of the public, potential CUD members that are here to hear what RTO Wireless is, is proposing in, in our CUD area. Great, great. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you for your time and, and uh, willingness to kind of listen to what we're doing. And uh, brief background is that uh, I was involved in a wireless uh, network that I built out in Maine and New Hampshire um, several years ago and AT&T bought it out. Um, and so then I took some of the members of that team and we started looking at ways to do some rural broadband and uh, had some good conversations with Microsoft. They, they liked our vision and uh, they uh, ended up investing money into us. And so they're a partner of ours in that we are, um, looking to, to work with the state of Vermont and proposed uh, deploying some broadband in, in the, the Brandon area. And uh, the state of Vermont thought that was a good idea. They proposed it. And uh, you know, unfortunately, the Telecommunications Connectivity Advisory Board uh, decided to go a different direction uh, than us. Uh, so that was a, a little setback for our plans in Brandon. But you know, we see a good opportunity in the state sees an opportunity to, to serve the people there with some broadband and Microsoft is very supportive of this. And in addition, we had AT&T uh, in our proposal and that they were interested in getting uh, wireless services out there. And a lot of this is tied to emergency services. So their first net platform, but also just regular cell phone usage as well. So we, we had a nice little package there, uh, but uh, the, uh, the board, as I said, went a different direction. Um, you know, we're not uh, very political animals. Uh, and I think that kind of hurt us is, I mean, if we invest a little more time with them, uh, could have a different outcome, but uh, just was a very short process with the, the CARES Act. Um, what we look to do is to use um, kind of carrier grade equipment. So this is, it's called CBRS uh, and it can be mobile and fixed technology. Uh, the providers are the same ones that provide the cellular service uh, for the wireless carrier. So this is Nokia and Ericsson. And so it's carrier grade equipment uh, and it can deliver broadband speeds of up to 100 megabits uh, downlink and uh, 10 plus megabits uplink, depending on how you allocate the spectrum. But this is uh, this would be great service um, that we'd be looking to deploy in the area. And it, had we gotten the grant that the state would have given us a, you know, uh, sufficient money to deploy our, our solution. And our solution is um, twofold. One is, is based on just the normal cell tower um, deployments, but, but those, um, if you don't have existing infrastructure, you can't get the coverage out to meet all the needs of the community. 
And so we have what's, what's called an aerostat. It's, uh, it's a tethered uh, blimp that gives it a little bit higher rise and it can cover an entire uh, you know, geography. So while Brandon's uh, you know, 40 square miles, the coverage of the aerostat can be uh, upwards of you know, 500 square miles uh, in good geography. So we could get uh, good coverage of the whole town and some surrounding communities as well. Uh, but it also enables us to locate it a uh, strategic place that's uh, going to be um, you know, the least uh, uh, kind of obstructive or uh, aesthetically um, obstructive to the community. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's a big advantage of what we're offering. And this is something that they said the state of Vermont was really excited about. And uh, AT&T is, is you know, partnering with us and Microsoft is supporting us on this. So we feel like it's a good solution. We're looking for ways to see if we can still pull off some type of deployment in, in Brandon and serve the people in your community. So Steve, you, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, so can you explain to me what it means by, um, like it can reach up to 500 square miles in good geography? Like what kind of geography are you talking about? Well, so, you know, I, I was, uh, try, you know, in, in Brandon yesterday and, and uh, trying to, meet up with, with Bill and just chat with him a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, the, my schedule was delayed so much, I think it probably was close to dinner time by the time I got into town. But if you look at, if you look at um, you know, your town, like you have the, uh, you kind of start going up in the hills, uh, and maybe you call it a mountain there off to the uh, Eastern side, you know, we're not gonna be able to penetrate that. So a good geography would be flat all around. So if you take a look at that and you say, okay, well, let, we could put something up that would be elevated. Now you kind of look around, you have a kind of, a, I don't wanna say it's a bowl, but you can look at the area and as you have those hills, you can go into the hill. You just can't get what I call the shadows of the hill or the backside of the hills. Mm -hmm. And so those end up blocking the signal and you can't get through those. So that, that would yeah. be a limiting factor. So um, I live about 1200 feet higher than Brandon. So it wouldn't, re it wouldn't reach me. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, these would go up uh, about 1500 feet. The question is if you're 1200 feet above Brandon, but there's a hill in front of you that's 1500 feet, you know, you're in the shadow of it. And we, we probably wouldn't be able to get over that. So you're, you're right about that. In that situation, if you're on the back side of a hill, there's something blocking it, we would be unable to reach you. Okay. I have a question. Um, so basically it's line of sight, you know, is, is what you're, you're saying uh, for the most part with some probably reflectivity. But talk about weather. I mean, you know, we have like hellacious windstorms and stuff. I mean, would something like this be interrupted when you have weather events and stuff like that? Since it's a, it sounds like a tethered blimp is what you're saying? Yeah, so, um, you know, I was also up uh, a little bit further north uh, in Huntington and, and they get uh, some wind storms coming through there as well right by Camelback and uh, maybe it's Camel's Hump, I get it confused. But Camel's Hump, yeah. Yeah, Camel's Hump. So the, the winds there can reach 90 plus miles per hour. Um, that would be pretty tough. So the aerostat can uh, sustain um, wind force of 60 miles per hour on a regular basis. It actually likes the wind. Uh, it's aerodynamic, so it, it, it stabilizes it. Um, the challenge is when you get above, you know, 80 mile per hour gusts. So if you get in the 90s, uh, the aerostat will be fine. But what happens is it, it puts a little extra strain on the fabric uh, of the aerostat. And so that extra strain will, and wear and tear will shorten the life of it. Uh, it's, not, it's not dangerous to it in the extent that it's, you know, will blow away, it, it can withstand those forces. But if you're looking at something that's gonna be north of 90 plus miles an hour, or it's gonna be like, a whipping wind like a tornado it's not a consistent airflow that is pretty dangerous and then what you do is you would bring it down that situation uh let the winds pass and then you, you bring it back up and therefore it, it avoids damage and that's uh ends up creating a little more downtime during storm during severe storms but also avoids a catastrophic ending where a, when those storms can bring down a communication tower and then you're going to be out of luck for if not months as that so tower I, think, gets I, I can tell you here what you would be facing you tell me if this would work or not but we have can have quite a few events where wind gusts can go up to 60 70 miles per hour 
and you know usually and it's wind gust so usually you're looking at winds that are 35 40 miles an hour you know gust can sometimes hit up to 60 plus up here where i live easily um but their gusts is that a factor with this or is that yeah, so what, what the, uh, the specs they, they provide us from the manufacturer is 60 mile per hour sustained wind is fine and 80 mile per hour gusts is fine. Okay. When you start going above that, that's when you start putting extra strain on it. And if, then if you go like materially above it, so if you start at the 100, 105, um, you, know, you, you may risk, what, what would happen is if you damage the integrity of the shape of the aerostat, then it becomes even um, less aerodynamic, which then creates more strain. And so, you know, you have sensors on there to detect it and how much stress is gonna be, is pulling on the tether. And at that point in time, you'd wanna start bringing it down as quick as you can um, in that condition, if you could pull, if, if, if you can. It sounds or, like it would work here. It sounds like it might work in this environment. I don't know if others would agree with me, but I was just, you know, when I heard the type of solution, it was like, how does that work, you know, with weather? But it sounds like they got it figured out for the most part. Yeah. Um, I'd yeah. ask the based on the restrictions when it comes to topography, Brandon is surrounded by hills. Um, and then it might reach um, X number of miles out. But if we're talking about geographic restrictions, uh, the Rutland region is hillier than not, um, yep. as well as substantially leafed out in terms of signal. Um, it's not uh, open farmland. Um, with that in mind, it, it would only be an answer potentially for Brandon itself, not other municipalities. So if we're looking at dollar cost to municipality, how much would this cost? Because it sounds like it would just serve Brandon. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to take a look at it. I mean, we, we, we thought there may be some coverage uh, up north. I'm, I'm not sure it would <clears throat> reach as far as, as uh, you know, Middlebury, but, you know, if it were on flat ground, it, it could. That's not out of the uh, reach of its uh, of the signal. It just is whether there's going to be, um, you know, hills inter interrupting that, uh, that pathway. But that, that is something that has to be considered whether you could bring in other communities uh, into the um, kind of in the services so that they could help support it. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of shadows up here, like has been mentioned. There is going to be a lot of shadowed area because of the hilly topography that we have. Yeah. And what's the average cost, though, for a, a single installation? So you have uh, two elements to it. One is the, uh, the cost of the unit. Uh, I should probably say three elements. Uh, the second is the um, amount of um, equipment integration that you have to do. And a lot of that times that, that's covered not um, by the town, but by the providers. And then the third is uh, the operations of it to maintain. So it's kind of a monthly operating cost that's, uh, that's needed. So if we were looking at and this is also a temporary thing. It's it would last what two years, one year. So the, well, there's <clears throat> there's elements of the system that uh, last uh, ten years. Um, the the envelope is kind of the aerostat itself. That is on a three to five year, depending on the. Uh, there's there's three elements. So it's salt uh, is bad. So by the ocean is going to weather it more. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the second one is uh, sunlight. And, uh, you know, that's also like if you're in Arizona or in, uh, you know, Colorado with the sunlight and the altitude also damages it. So you don't have to worry about that. So you're probably at the, you know, four year life with the, uh, the envelope. Um, so that would be the extent of that system. And then most people have a, a spare envelope that you can swap out if it starts showing wear and tear. On that. Okay. But so just with that in mind, in terms of age and then back to the cost, Aside from the cost that you'd have to estimate out for actual internet service, what um, is the estimate, an a, just an average cost for the tech and the installation, those two components that you mentioned? Yeah, so the, the system itself um, runs is $800,000. Um, that is with uh, just the one envelope and then the entire system. And there's going to be another um, 200000 of integration cost. And then there's a, a monthly 
uh, cost that's tied to it. And the monthly cost is is usually, well, hopefully less, a lot less than the, the broadband cost. Um, so that that could be offset. Um, and the monthly cost is referred to the what the CUD as a network would pay or what the user would pay. Well, so yeah, there's a there's a monthly cost for the users, right? So you provide the service to them, and then that yeah. that would then offset the um, you know the, the, one of the costs of providing that service would be the the Aerostat operations. So installation, though, you are looking at around a million. Yeah, that the system and the integration of the uh, electronics and getting that um, be in a position where it could be deployed be about a million dollars. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I forgot, I didn't write it down, but what was the coverage? How many square feet? 500. So the, the coverage, um, it, again, it's uh, depends on the, the wireless technology you have. So I'm not trying to be too vague. But in what we're deploying, which was CBRS, um, that signal is is uh, measured about 15 to 25 miles. So 15 miles um, runs you about 700 square miles, and this is in flat terrain. So obviously that's not the case here. So you're really going to be limited by the uh, the hills um, on that. So we can cover up to the top of the hills, and then any uh, you know openings if there's um, you know open in the north if you go up Route Seven. You know, to be able to get covered along there, um, as that's not quite as bad as the hills to the uh, to the east. I think that's 153 or something like that that you take through the mountains. So 500 square miles, give or give or take. 500 to 2,000 um, is, a, is a typical yeah. coverage area. Gotcha. And Steve, how, what are the heights of, um, of hills that are going to cause a problem? Like how, what's the elevation? Uh, so the, the system uh, that we designed go up to uh, 1,500 to 2,000 feet above ground, AGL. So you'd be looking at a height of a hill above that is, is going to block the signal beyond it. And if, if the hill is lower than that, then it's going to block just kind of the back side of the hill. And then the signal will, will be back available once you, once you clear that, that shadow area. Thank you. I had a, qu I had a question, Steve. Uh, the, uh, have you looked into other, I guess, um, flatter areas? I mean, like, you know, I love the idea of spending all the CUD's money to uh, to make Brandon more connected. However, you know, just, you know, we have members in Sudbury as well as Benson and down into West Rutland, um, a spot where it's still the Southern part of the, the Champlain Valley where it's a little more open. Have you guys looked into any of those spaces and, you know, what kind of coverage you could expect in that flatter farm, farmer area? Yeah, we, we have looked at, at, at some areas um, that uh, would be more favorable. We've also, you know, lim eliminated those that are not. I would say that uh, if if you do get into more of a valley, uh, that that's just going to get you a better return in terms of coverage area. Uh, the second piece to this, and I, I didn't factor this into the cost that I was explaining to you, <clears throat> is that AT and T is interested uh, and has uh, was committed to the brand in deployment. So. The figures I cite to you, and I don't know exactly how at and is going to do it, whether they're going to sit there and subsidize it on a monthly basis, or if they're going to do an upfront capital on some monthly basis, but calculate that they would do at least a third, if not a half of that cost. So that reduces the cost uh, to the area right out of the, at the bat. at and has selected 13 locations in the state of Vermont that it was interested in. Uh, partnering with us on, and there may be potentially more, but but those 13 and Brandon was one of them. And that's the one that the state of Vermont uh, worked with us on and said, that's our, that'd be our top priority uh, to deploy in. So um, that's, that's the good news is that Brandon, if you look at some of these other areas, we'd have to consult with AT&T if we wanted the cost saving aspect of it to have a partnership in it, because they may not need to go or may find that they have a different solution in that area. Um, but it would definitely be, in general, much better 
because it's you know more open that you don't have hills uh, breaking breaking down the the, uh, the coverage of your network. The uh, also you know something that we're running up against certainly as a CMD is the ability to uh, to spend some CARES Act money by uh, really by December twentieth. Uh, do you guys have the ability to do anything? Like Yeah, so the, uh, the December 20th, uh, and this is kind of what we were up against with um, the, uh, the the Vermont pitch is that, you know, we, we put our initial bid with them uh, in July. And uh, and then I think we did the brand and, uh, you know, we had met with them. I mean, we've been meeting with Vermont for uh, over two years um, based on their coverage co-RFP. But... Um, the amount of time it, it has elapsed since that December 30th deadline for them, it's December 20th for you, puts it so it's very difficult for us to come in with a, a permanent solution. And what we had, were talking about is that we um, could do a, just a trial by then if that met the CARES Act funding, show the signal works and the expense, then uh, take it down to integrate AT&T, which would take uh, a month or two, and then redeploy it. That's that's the one way we could probably pull it off. It's not perfect, and uh, you know the, someone may view that as not quite meeting the the standards. It depends how you do it. Vermont seemed to think that that could be sufficient for them, but um, that that that's the only way we could not put up a permanent solution and not take it down without because AT and T wouldn't be ready by that time, and that you know we'd have to run a test unit uh, there to get it done that quickly. We don't keep these in inventory. With RTO, I mean, so the, the way this would work, let's say we had the million dollars and we voted today to, to do this, like what kind of support, what does RTO Wireless do? Do you do, they do the billing for the for the ISP as an ISP? Are you guys just the manufacturer of the technology and equipment and like a, a middleman? What what role would RTO play in that? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we are a wireless internet service provider. So we have all the back office um, and, and what we look to do um, is to partner with, with local groups so that they could sell. We have the billing platform, so all, they run the billing through us. Uh, we pay them, so all that's set up. And we just look for um, some local help to partner with, with RTO um, in terms of the selling, uh, the installations. We look for some local help. We, we do have uh, partnerships with uh, companies that have presence in Vermont. Uh, Tilson's one of them that we do uh, a national relationship with them. So that, that's uh, the, the mode. Our, we, we do have um, our head of sales is in Burlington. Uh, so he, he would be uh, involved in building out the sales team as well. Anybody else have any further questions? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Um, is there a, a, any information you can send to the group? Um, you know, I guess after the fact, uh, at you, one point you had shared a PowerPoint that was specific to the state. I don't know if you, if that's something that's for public consumption or not. Yeah, no, um, I, and I have, I have one I could send to the group that goes through Aerostats. One is um, more of a general, just frequently asked questions, a little bit more background in the solution. Um, and then there's another one that I could send that covers the broadband wireless access, BWA, we call it, um, that also give you some uh, understanding on the solution as well and more information on, on who RTO is and, uh, and our backgrounds of the team. Excellent. Um, it, okay. And, and I mean, and I guess, I mean, if you want to seriously, I'm going to give me an official proposal that you guys might have to send along. Yeah, let, let me let me put that together for you, um, and uh, but I could send you the uh, bill. Maybe I'll just send it to you if you don't mind distributing it to the team, or unless uh, you have the emails, I could do it. But um, I could uh, get you those presentations and work on the pricing and send that to you subsequent to it, and that's uh, probably by Monday. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us, Steve. Appreciate it. We got uh, we're about halfway through our agenda, so. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I know it's. Thursday evening, so I appreciate you staying late uh, and let me cut into this. So enjoy it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.
Looks like it's just the six of us. Let's put some lights on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get dark. Um, I don't know what the heck he was, but it looked like it was dark outside already. I see lights on out there. He's in Massachusetts. Oh, huh. interesting. It's too bad they didn't have like a repeater system, you know, where they could put that blimp up and then hit the top of other mountains and then project down from there. Then you could hit those other communities like us, Hubbardton. I'm, I'm in fear we with 1500 feet, we'd be shadowed, you know, on this side. And it's too bad because something like that, where I would love to have a hundred megabits. I'd love to have, <laughs> I'd like to have it today. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Well, the other issue is anything that mentions cell tower, um, you kind of have to take a step back because it's really hard to get those approved. Yeah. Um, and there's restrictions in the regional plan as well as municipal plans. So it's just, it's, it's a hard balance and also bang for the buck. If we have something that's going to service one town, we really have to consider the investment on a regional basis. That's just hard. All right. And maybe that also shows why at t is so interested in the technology is that maybe they see this as a end around for them for towers versus, you know, versus a blimp yeah. or aerostat. You mentioned um, the state didn't go with him for an earlier project. What did they do instead? Uh, they tried to work with Consolidated. Um, I believe the contract was made available and then Consolidated backed out. So the state was just left with money and no project. Mm. Like 700,000. Mm. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, well, good. Um, we're moving on to uh, grant updates. Uh, it's number seven. And number seven and number 10 really could kind of come together. Um, uh, there's a new grant out from the Vermont Community Foundation. Uh, they've asked CUDs to apply. Uh, it's for up to twenty thousand dollars to help support our uh, to help support the CUDs, to help support broadband um, these broadband initiatives. And and the great thing about this grant is that it's not tied to CARES money. It's from the Vermont Community Foundation, so there's no timeline. The twentieth, we don't have to spend the money by the end of the year. Um, uh, Amanda, you got anything you wanted to add about it? That um, Yeah, the highlight is that unlike, unlike most of our money right now, we don't have to spend it by December 30. Um, so if we apply, it's probably best, unless we're given guidance by Vermont Community Foundation, to be vague about it so we can apply it towards a, a part-time staff person's salary, or maybe we need to fill in the gap on another grant. Um, there's also an option to pay uh, RISI, uh, which is also on our agenda, and the company providing the support for our feasibility study uh, to build out a pre-enrollment program. And that is important because it would uh, provide us a means to uh, build the business case in addition to the feasibility study for a company to come in and provide service. Uh, some CUDs have gone a little bit easier and done uh, like a Google form. However, I don't see that flying very well in some of our communities uh, with asking them to register, fill in their personal information, such as address and name into a Google form. Uh, there is software that does exist that does this, but it's $1,000 a month. <laughs> um, and then you get charged per additional municipality that signs on. So it's a very costly um, resource potentially, but it is um, quite important when it comes to getting the attention of contractors to come in and do the work or provide a service. All to say is the Vermont Community Foundation money could be used for any number of things. Um, and I'm rambling. Uh, less strings. Less, less strings than they want to give us the money. <laughs> what? I said less strings than they want to give us the money. Which yeah, is, that's, is, that's the most important part, actually. That's all you need to know. All that needs to go in the notes, actually. You need a motion were... to apply. <laughs> yes. Motion to apply. Making a motion that we apply for the Vermont Community Foundation's grant for uh, more, for $20,000 yes. for support. I second that. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Sam. So is that Amanda, are you able to do that through the planning commission? Like who's doing the, all the work? Um, Bill's already started on a draft. I've done a review. <laughs> so we've already 
started on that one and hopes that you would approve. Oh, excellent. Well, good. Thank you for your work. Uh, but that also leads us, there's plenty more grant writing to be done. Um, there's also more CARES Act funds, which we were just made aware of that are available. So we can apply for up to 300,000. Um, we're scrambling to find um, identifiable projects for that. Um, the issue being getting a contractor to actually give me a call back. Um, minorly hostile about that. So I'll just leave that one there. Um, but uh, the other option is that we apply because we may need additional funds. Um, we have to look uh, to support towns that have requested hotspot support. I was um, contacted by Department of Public Service today saying that we should consider using our current funds and any new funds to provide, purchase and provide hotspot tech and potential drops, um, drops being any necessary last mile connection. Amanda? For yeah. So sorry, we have to actually, um, the motion has to pass before we can discuss it. I'm so sorry. It's all oh. good. I'm in favor. Another motion to apply for the Vermont CARES grant up to $300,000. Anyone want a second? Okay, so that's two different motions. We haven't accepted. We have to do a unanimous uh, vote. Um, okay. All in favor for the Vermont Community Foundation funds. Yeah. All right. Aye. Yeah. And by, yeah and, and so it's funny because, yeah, <laughs> as we look into this, you know, you know the, 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 the blurry line between unanimous consent and, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. That's quite right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, sounds like uh, we have an approval of the motion around the Vermont okay. Community Foundation. Moving on to our next topic, which is other grants, and like Amanda brought up information about the from, uh, about the uh, additional CARES money. Does anybody want to open up discussion on that? So no. we're looking at what to spend the money on. Um, if anyone has thoughts, um, let me know. But so Amanda, I. Um... I talked to them, well, we applied for the hotspots and I applied for their ex extenders from our town hall, just so we can, uh, and we did this like 10 years ago with the, a grant that came through and we were able to do the whole village as a wireless network, but you know, it's the technology is, you know, 11 years old. So all of those, yeah. um, I forget what they're called. Um, but anyway, they're extenders and they just need to get installed. So I'm hoping that we will get that, but I think that's an easy way. We hooked on to fiber through consolidated for our town hall. So we have great speed. And um, but now it's how like, do you include working with consolidated for your fiber? I'm sorry, what was the question? Have you how has consolidated worked for you as a provider well, of fiber? Um, good. I mean, it, it took them forever. Um, we did it just before we did it just before COVID hit because I was like, oh, I could get Vermont Cares to pay for this, but um, it took like six months to them actually coming and they'd come back and, and it was a really long uh, ordeal. And um, but the uh, monthly fee was just a little bit more than what we were paying for through Comcast, so it was it's definitely our speed is great. All right, that's good to know. Um, but for your extenders, that's something we'd consider. I did just get a list. Um, so I'm gonna be going through to see who from the Rutland region applied um, mm -hmm. and send that to the group. So that we can, I guess, see, and I would propose using our current CARES funds um, and potentially using um, additional funds if we need to apply for them to make sure any hotspot requests are met specifically by municipalities and or schools. Mm -hmm. So that's my current thought. Um, and if we happen to hear from a provider that decides they actually want to do work um, and run a line or provide a wireless network um, in the time that we have, which is not much against December 30, mm -hmm. then we could apply for funds for that. But we're running up against the December 30 deadline, which is providing the biggest difficulty. Yeah. I got a question, Marianne, about the, uh, the network or the potential network that you have set up in West Rutland. So you guys have fiber to your municipal offices and then you set up repeaters on your 
within the public um, right away. Last time we did one down at Mary's Cafe, which is, um, you know, and then we went down towards the laundromat. And then I think that we had libraries now hooked up, but I think we might've had one at the library. So, you know, it, it was the village center and they, and they went pretty far and it was all flat and there was no, you know, sometimes when the trees, you know, there are a lot of leaves or snow or whatever, but um, you no, know, and when that's, so that was 12 years ago, I think. Um, so the technology has definitely gotten better. So, but you, but you have the exi you have, but you have the existing repeaters, or had the existing repeaters, the space on the poles, the 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 permissions from the landowners, uh, the yeah. access. So yeah. the, the replacement, of, the replacement of those repeaters with better technology yeah. would be a potential good thing for the downtown of West yeah. Valley. Mm -hmm. And did people was an open network? Or is this something that people subscribe to? Um, we had, we yeah, we had an open network. I mean, we could knock them off if they were like downloading movies or whatever, but you know. Cool. cool. Yeah, it was good. We've been exploring something similar in Brandon, so. Well, especially with the outside stuff, like you want you want to cover your park areas and you know, you want, you want people outside to be able to use it, so. The uh, it, it, you know that well, that was so uh, as we're, as we're discussing more of this the, the additional cares money or grant money that could be applied for um, the, the discussion about being able to provide drops or wireless networks it's I mean should we make a motion on on this it sounds like we're sort of all in agreement that you know if we do get additional cares money that we would be able to spend it if we could find a contractor spend it to create these these other drops in these underserved areas i think maybe this would be another um i need to make sure it's also kosher open meeting law but um uh yeah. we need to maybe have an identifiable application to run by the group to say yes we're applying for this and this is how much um so we could do that as a vote by email as soon as we have that specific language yeah, I think just find, find the technician is the is the more difficult part. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. That's, that's been the, it's just yeah. Um, so, just to reiterate, for Cassandra's sake and for minutes' sake, sounds like we're okay to do this by way of email, identifying uh, by way of email vote uh, based on the board members that are here. Uh, the uh, contractors that can provide these wireless hotspots, uh, emergency hotspots, and use care our CARES money that's been that we have applied for and received, as well as CARES money that we could potentially apply for and receive before the uh, end of the year deadline, and that we could do that by way of a, a email vote to identify the contractor. Everyone agree? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot my speaker wasn't on. Yes, I agree. Chris, you good? I certainly am, but you're not going to be able to extend it all the way up to my place, are you? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> that's what we're looking to do. I mean, that's, you know, like we want to serve everybody in the CUD. So we've got Sudbury, Alberton. We're definitely not forgetting about you. In fact, I mean, those addresses have been identified as, as you know, as focuses by, by the, by the state. Right, Amanda? Sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all for it. Cool. By hook or by crook. Um, moving on to uh, item number 11, uh, job description for a potential clerk. So we, I mean, we, ha there's a lot of work that's being done. You know, certainly the Rutland Regional Planning Commission is doing a lot of the heavy lifting through, through Amanda. Um, the town of Brandon is doing some with, with, with my work, uh, doing economic development, uh, but it would really help to have somebody that could do some of this work on a part-time basis. Um, it just, I mean, it's a lot of emails and paperwork and more paperwork and, you know, the, uh, you know, Amanda's become one of my top users in my, in my email, you know, just back and forth with the information that we're sharing. Um, you know, if we had somebody that could, that could put that together for us and, have that be something they do and send out to the entire board. It would 
it would alleviate some of the, the strain on, on uh, our, our limited resources. Um, no, I was just realizing we can't put out an ad really um, until we have an EIN. Right. Um, so would it help in the meantime if I draft up a job description and send it out to the group via email to flesh out in the meantime so we have something ready to go? Sorry. Yes. yes. Sounds like somebody else is agreeing in the background. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <The> cat. <laughs> really, I thought that was the applicant. <laughs> um, and uh, fantastic, yeah. So yeah, just so we've cast another job for, for Amanda um, to create a job description around what a potential clerk could do. Unless there's anybody else that has any expertise in creating uh, a job description around a, a clerk position. Okay, Amanda, you're it. Um, moving, moving on to item 12, uh, our, uh, we have on here, First Light. Um, first Light provides fiber services in Vermont. Uh, they offer a lot of different services. Uh, the town of Brandon has spoken with First Light many times in the last four years. Um, I know Amanda is uh, Amanda and I have both talked to First Light about what they can do for us as a CUD to provide infrastructure and support to uh, or support for hotspots and uh, Amanda, do you want to add, you want to add anything to the First Light discussion? baby's probably there so so we've, we, we've experienced and that's some frustration just i mean it's a steep learning curve in all this broadband uh broadband 101 sorry no no it's quite a, you know there's a lot of the steep learning curve of the broadband 101 about what you know what service providers can provide what service um and what we've been able to figure out with first slide is that, again they own a lot of the backbone uh, uh infrastructure around fiber in the state of vermont they have a line that runs up through uh through the heart of the state, they might provide some backbone services for some of the other providers. Uh, they, um, we've been contacted by somebody who's interested in uh, getting quotes to municipalities for for fiber services. Um, you know, a way that we can potentially help to get more action, I guess, from First Light is to do some of the legwork for them and find out from each of our municipalities who's providing their internet service and telephone service and what their monthly bills are. And I didn't know if that's something that maybe the, the folks in each of these communities could compile and bring to the group so that we can present a, uh, you know, a, more information to them to make it more palatable to do some of the work in our CUD. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. So it would be uh, it would be the the municipal uh, municipal entities within your communities. Uh, and, and, I mean, or the ones that you might have control over access to. I mean, for Marianne, I, you know, I guess it'd be West Rutland municipal offices and any municipal sites that have telephone service or, or, and or internet. Um, Cassandra, that'd be pretty easy for you. Probably the Goshen Town Hall might be the only thing. Uh, you know, in Hubberton, Chris, um, you know. Assuming there's a town clerk's office that has some kind of internet service and telephone service, um, if you could get compile that information and bring it to the group. Yeah, sure. You're not going to like it. I'm sure. Well, we may. <laughs> you never know. But what you know, what you know, what they're paying for uh, internet, what they're paying for, uh, who their internet service provider is, who their telephone service provider is, and what those monthly bills are on those sites that they pay for. Yeah, I can get that. In Pittsford, Sam. Yeah, ma'am. If you could get that from uh, from the town offices, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Do we what don't is it want that you're looking for? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what was that, Cassandra? I'm uh, sorry. Um, so you don't want information about the actual town's people, only like town buildings? Only town buildings. Okay. And Sam, could you do Please. that for Pittsford? Yeah, so you're looking for providers and costs, what their bills are and stuff? Yep. 
So who, yeah, who okay. the internet service provider are, are and, and their telephone service providers, they tend to be the same, but sometimes they're not, especially in rural areas, I imagine. Uh, right. Uh, and then what the monthly bills are for all their sites and, and, and addresses for those as well. Okay. Yeah, I can reach out to John Haverstock for that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it should be, I mean, should be relatively easy to compile. They pay those bills monthly and you know, the addresses are right at the top of those bills. I was able to do it for the town of Brandon fairly easily. And of course, I've been working in the municipal office, but to walk over and I mean, they have the, all the Comcast bills and each of the addresses and everything's broken down. Uh, also, just a random question. Um, if anyone has contacts with those that work in telecom, um, it's, a, it's a personal uh, curiosity is, uh, there are other providers of fiber that abut our border with New York. Um, so if we can build a business case, maybe by partnering with Addison and incentivize um, those companies to do work over this way. Um, that is, so I'm more looking for contacts because you can't exactly just, I'm so sorry, um, call up Verizon Fios. Um, so if you happen to know contacts within companies, it would behoove us to see what else is available in terms of capacity. I'll work on, on getting some of that info. Just, yeah, personal networks, um, cause nothing's online, ironically. Thank you. What do you want that information sent to? Who's collecting them? Um, I am <clears throat> going a little, I guess, contact happy and trying to reach out to whomever I can to get feedback um, with our, our deadline, especially with the CARES Act funds. We need someone that can actually uh, turn around on a dime to get this work done. Um, and I know Addison's in the same position we are. So if we're gonna you know, remotely consider a blimp at a million dollars, but could maybe have some lines run and signal extenders and hotspots put in by someone else on a wider geographic scope. I'm trying to reach out to see what a company might be capable of. And maybe a bigger company is capable of that. I don't know if they're interested, but I at least kind of want to have that conversation if, if possible, if that makes sense. If this sounds completely asinine, just let me know. So this information about the town and the providers and the phone and the bills. Oh, that. Who's who's collecting that information? Is... Uh, you can send you can send that to me if you want. I, I can shoulder the the burden of certainly of uh, you know doing doing the outreach. And this is something that's that's going to be good information for us to have. It's a good bargaining chip for us when we're okay. at the very least talking to first light. But if not, some of these other cell phone providers or these other providers as well. Like that's yeah. a larger okay. care. For, for gotcha. That. No, thank you. Bill, we're hitting that six o'clock time. Are we already? Oh my goodness gracious! Okay, uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> the, the witching hour. Uh, first light, emergency deployment hotspot, and is item number thirteen that we talked about. We kind of already talked about that. The Vicuda update. A man already said that Vicuda. We haven't. They haven't met really since. There's no Vicuda update. New member recruitment. Uh, the, uh, Pulteney was on the line for a little bit. Um, if there's anybody, any other contacts you have in towns, you know, the larger our CUD becomes, the more power we have to negotiate with with carriers, uh, with, with everybody. You know, it makes us look better in the eyes of the state. So you can talk it up with your friends in Rutland or you know, Ollie or Danby or Wallingford. You know, please do. Do you think, has anyone spoken to Rutland? City or town? City. Um, no, because they are inundated with cable and apparently that makes it a high conversion, uh, a low rate of conversion for mm -hmm. users. So they have sufficient internet, even if it's not fiber. Okay. Unfortunately. And we can still try though. And Rizzy, um, our, our, our the company that's doing the consulting work, they're close on the feasibility study, Amanda? Um, yeah, I think we should have that in a couple of weeks. So that should inform a lot of this as well. Great. Um, any other business? 
see none. Uh, let's set our next meeting. Do Thursdays at 5 o'clock work for most? Oh, that should work for me unless something comes up. Yep, works here. Okay. Um, let, uh, let's look. I mean, we've got some tight timelines. I, I, I feel like a month would be too late. Uh, perhaps uh, it's going to be a crazy week, I think, but uh, third, fourth, fifth. November 5th. Right, that should people. work. Okay. And we will also be doing some business by way of email with a couple of those votes. I mean, that provides us, you know, some of the, you know, the, the RFP information as well as the, the potential for the, the, the grant uh, grant application and or, or uh, identif identifying uh, vendors for some of that work if something comes out of the work in the next two years. So November 5th, everybody, does it work? Yep. 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 November 5th, uh, 5 o'clock. November 5th, 5 o'clock. Yeah, 5 o'clock. Uh, any motion to, to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And debatable. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for your volunteerism and your hard work. And thank you. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bill. Have a good Bye. night. Thanks.